Live from the Mandalay Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Insight 2014. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas for IBM Insight, inside the social lounge at Insight Go. This is theCUBE special presentation here, live on the ground. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Franz Gil Dill, partner at PKL, Knowledge Partners. He's a big data guy going way back. Welcome to theCUBE. Nice to be here. Procter & Gamble, I mean, you've got your hands, you've wrangled some data in I've the past. Yep. Um, yep. So, <laughs> you've got some experience. I want to mm -hmm. get your take on it because mm -hmm. Bob Picciano was just on for um, IBM. Mm -hmm. He's old school, he's seen that whole database transition, right. client-server, right. operationalizing, mm -hmm. process improvement, now to utter chaos, inflection point today. Right, what's your exactly. take on it? What's your take on the current my, situation? My, my take on it is it's something we've done for a very long time, but it hasn't very been very well implemented into the corporate corporate structure, if you will. In other words, you could come up with solutions to, to problems. There was, there was enough data, but there was never the big data that we have today. But it was very difficult to get it implemented into the, into the, uh, into the uh, 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 infrastructure of the company as, as well. So there's a lot of, um, the word engagement is coming out a lot. Right. I, didn't, I didn't have a chance to talk to Bob Picciano about this because he had to run. Yeah. I mean, they got some big time announcements coming tomorrow from what yeah. I'm room, 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 you know, right. is going on. But uh, engagement used to be a, a system of engagement. You know, that's a right. record. It's a, kind of a data warehousing mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. we are here in the engagement social media lounge and engagement means actually like, talking to people. Right? Right, so now exactly. you're bridging da active data from people, humans, into yeah. systems and data changes data, what Bob was talking about, as a data person out in the field, this is a complicated kind of nuance right. that people are trying to grow, mm. get their arms around. What we have today though is we have people that are really interested in engagement. In a sense, we didn't have that 20 years ago. In other words, you would get the executive, uh, you talk to the executive, you say, we want to help you solve your problems, and they say, fine, and they would say, we'll talk to you next month about that. They weren't very interested in engaging you with the data they have. Today, almost everyone knows that it's a data problem and almost everyone knows that data is being gathered constantly by their devices, by manufacturing systems, et cetera. In a large company, you've got many different kinds of data being gathered at once. Uh, executives are very interested in how you take that data and apply it to, to value to them. And so at least today, everybody is interested in talking. It's not to say that they, they know how to talk yet, they know how to make the conversation, but they want to talk, there's no doubt about that. So in, in, the, in the early 90s, for example, I worked with P&G executives, and you get maybe one out of 10 executives that would have a, a, a device on their desk, on a actual yeah. desktop on their desk, that would be willing to look at the data in, in something other than printed sheets, And P&G, Procter & Gamble, they're data, they were very much data jocks. Very much so. And if, PG is a good example. They were very early, they were data oriented. They understood that data would drive their business, especially in the world of marketing. So, very much so. But even there, even there, it was hard to convince people to engage, getting back to your word again. What were the toughest right. questions that these P&G guys were asking? Because, you know, my experience on the consumer side back then, there's probably those age-old questions that come down from the top, like, hey, how are we doing with, how are right. we doing with positioning? How's the brand doing? What's the product the, doing? Are our customers happy? Does the advertising work? What advertising works best? Should we do, be doing different advertisements? Uh, in, a, in the case of new initiatives, new products that are putting out, how well are they doing? There was a lot of work going on looking at, okay, we need to know as early as possible whether this brand is doing well enough to keep it moving. Okay, so this, this issue of speed, which was talked this morning, was a very important issue. But at that time, it was very difficult to get that data. You bought it from Nielsen, you got it from different services, for example. It took m weeks, months to get that data in place. Huge lag. Very much lag. And now, people see, you can get that data pretty quickly. Okay, so you lived in an environment where you were getting peppered with the questions, you knew there was right. lag, you had to send out to the reports come out, it's like that, that Office Space movie, you know, the TPS <laughs> reports, and you know, right. it's just like, oh my God. Right, right. How, when is it going to come in, what month? <laughs> now, right. and you know, we're experiencing you know, an amazing inflection point where, for the first time in the history of the world, 
You can measure everything. You can measure everything. So yeah. how do you deal with that? How do you just jump in? Well, I'm so partner in game, all these guys are like, you know, jumping in, <laughs> chaos. I, I think the other word that was brought up today was curated. There has, still has to be the role of a, cu a curator, and there are different kinds of curators. There are people that know the data very well, they know how it's been gathered, where it comes from, how old or new or, or, or stale it is, uh, but there's also the analytics person that needs to be involved. Uh, and that's, I was very, it was very nice seeing things like Watson uh, Cognitive, for example, and Watson uh, Analytics this morning, which is an, an, an attempt, and it seems to be a good attempt, to try to understand how that curation, that analytical curation, uh, process works, uh, and the other thing I think I didn't see there in that in that in that particular presentation was it works differently for different people. So if I'm if I'm uh, basically curating the data and the results of the analytics to an analyst, that's a different thing from when I, where I'm curating data, for example, to someone who is an executive, for example, who's responsible for a particular marketing operation. Uh, so that has to look different, and we saw something, for example, like uh, uh, this morning where you could look at the, uh, the word count, the, the word map, for example, for how many people were actually looking at something. Those are the kinds of interfaces that work very well with executives. They're easy to scan, they're easy to understand, you don't have to talk to start to talk, uh, you know, gobbledygook. Uh, it's statistics. really translating the data mm -hmm. into a story. And the right and into a relevant, targeted <clears throat> match between the audience. Well, I was getting going to get back. To, <laughs> I was going to get the story because that's another thing that Procter and Gamble and many other companies have started to pull in, which is how do I tell this as a story? Get it from data all the way to what should we do? What should what should we have as a result of this of this analytical? You know, Dave result? and I talk about this all the time because we're mm -hmm. immersed in this media mm -hmm. world and we have our crowd chat venture. Right. Are going on, and we're data mm -hmm. geeks. I mean, we love looking at right. the data. We've been looking at them, mm -hmm. doing a lot of development on that site with our team there. And you know, one of the things that's interesting is that the web and the content market of the internet, go back to the web 1.0, mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. all the same properties that this new con digital convergence. That's right. not so much about content or marketing, right. it's really about the engagement piece. So what we're seeing right. is some very interesting similarities between mm -hmm. content or metadata, mm -hmm. behavioral data, semantic, contextual right. data, right. and that matching. So the idea of providing executives with storytelling is a content problem. Exactly, and when you think of marketing, the way marketing works, this whole notion of, of creating stories, storyboards, is a very natural connection to a marketing world because they think in terms of, okay, what were the five steps that got me here? And show them to me in a very simple format uh, and direct yeah. me through them and, and also let's talk about each of the key pieces of it and let's talk about yeah. where things could go wrong or don't work with the way we expected them to do or where the data was incorrect. You also mentioned se semantics. That's another huge issue for a large company which is you know, what, what do the words that we use within a company really mean? They mean different things. Look, to give an example from Procter & Gamble, the word tide is a, is a, is a detergent. Mm -hmm. It's also a, a, uh, a geological and ocean okay. term, for example. Something as simple high as tide. that. <laughs> so, so yeah, somebody could be Green saying- grass and high tide. high tide. What does that mean? So this whole notion of how do I understand, what's the ontology of that understanding of what the data, especially when we're working with unstructured data, uh, how do we utilize that, how do we understand it, uh, talking to a medical system, a medical analytics system versus a, versus a system for a large marketing company, a large manufacturing company, is a very different thing. Yeah, I want to get your ta take on this. I want to go out and kind of go out and spin up in the, into the ether a little bit on some concepts, just riff with you. Mm -hmm, this sure. notion of data operating systems is interesting. Mm -hmm. What you just mentioned is essentially, right. data is the key resource to dynamically right. provision an application mm -hmm. benefit for the lack of a mm -hmm. better description. Meaning, mm -hmm. if I want operational analytics, I can take data and make it work. Right. If I want robotics, I can make machine learning work for that. So these are applications of data. If these are things that are becoming applications of data, if that thesis is true, mm -hmm. then data is a programmable resource. And if that's the case, it should be a fabric or a layer. <laughs> so well, that's yeah. not your traditional, you know, no, siloed disk and storing data right. and, and you know, mining it, pulling stuff in and out. That is an ever-evolving Organism. Yeah, or and do we have the question often comes up, and I've been in many projects where we would show up and say, "Do we have the data to do this?" And it turns out we either don't have it; it's in the right form; it's been gathered in a way that's now ancient and can't be used. I mean, there are many reasons why data won't work against the problem that you're att you're attempting to, to to do. And so, those are the kinds of things that you will run into frequently. This creates more mm -hmm. chaos, which I love. Yeah. Chaos yeah, yeah. theory kind of <laughs> plays in with network right. theory and all this stuff. Right. Kirk Bourne was on earlier, and we were talking about mm -hmm. this, and he had an interesting point. I like what he said. He actually said it when he was walking off because we kind of kept the conversation yeah. rolling. Yeah, yeah. You have like a behind the stage you should, scene. Yeah, behind the scene. But he said that you know back when he was doing all this 
computational algorithmic mm -hmm. stuff um, when his physics, uh, astrophysics work mm -hmm. is that the software package would throw out all the skewed data points off outside the mean. Right. Which right. now he's finding, bring back the long those tail, are, absolutely. those are discovery points that now are they absolutely are. exploratory, mm -hmm. one, in real time, mm -hmm. and two, are providing amazing insights. Right. So what's your take on that? And is that, do you agree with that? Oh yes, I absolutely agree. In fact, that was almost the methodology in the, you know, 20 years ago was to throw out all those, all those data points. There must be something wrong with that data, so why should we even keep it? How and it turns out there's a richness in that data, in that data on the, outside, the, outside the mean, that's of a lot of value, and it makes lots of sense. In fact, we even, even talked about things like, how do we value, how do we value, do we evaluate those particular items of data as they sit outside, uh, they look like outliers. But, but you're right, those are the kinds of things that that's a big change that's occurred. So certainly. Dave Vellante wants to get a word in. Hey, I've been so dominating. Dave, Dave, right, Dave right, welcome right. to the conversation. Thank you. Hi. So you, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I, I no, no worries, you these guys were on a roll. Yeah, yeah, so you started yeah. off the conversation talking right. about uh, there are a lot of people in, in analytics practitioners saying, mm -hmm. ah, we've been doing big data for a long time. Mm -hmm. We hear it all the time, big data, big deal, sure, I'm sure. dealing with petabytes, yeah. but things are different. Yeah. Uh, certainly there's technology like Hadoop mm -hmm. and NoSQL that are different. You've been mm -hmm. talking about some of the cultural changes, but I wonder if we could sort of boil it down. Is it different? What's different specifically? It's different, it's different for several reasons. One in which we, can, we, can, we have the tools, we have the analytical tools, and certainly the, the parallel processing tools, to be able to look at much more data than we had before, so that's one. The second thing we have is we have, we have the data. We simply have the data that we can work against. In the past, we very often did not have the data, there were holes in it, we, we, we just couldn't do the kinds of things we, 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 we can do today. So that's another piece that certainly is very different from, from what it was before. Uh, there's also an understanding, it gets back to the engagement notion, there's an, un, an understanding from everyone, from you know, new hires up to, to the executives of the company, that there's value in lots of data, in lots of, and not only lots, but also volatile data, data that we would have thrown away in the past, data that we are looked at very closely. There's value in being able to take a closer look at that. And so that's another thing that's radically changed just in the last few years. Technologically wise, I'm not, you know, machines are faster, some of the methodologies are better, but they haven't changed as radically as that notion of we can now engage with the data, if you will, that you, we couldn't do in the So past. culturally, are people accepting the data more? I'm, of course, I'm worried, right? Because mm -hmm. who's the consumer of the data? Some right. P&L manager, right. and if, if, if that, uh, that insight uh, conflicts with, mm -hmm. with an initiative that I want to drive, mm -hmm. what am I going to do? I'm going to attack the data, I'm going to show a different right. data source, I'm going to confuse my executives right. and say, and they're going to say, well, who, who's the, <laughs> what's the truth here? Are we further away from the single version of the truth? Mm -hmm. How, has mm -hmm. that changed at all? Uh, no, that, that in fact hasn't changed, but people understand in the past they didn't have to deal with the data, now they understand they do need to deal with it. <laughs> in the early days, we, we basically worked with executives directly, the executives that would listen to us, that would engage with us, uh, we worked with the data, we got results, but some of the next, the next level of management wasn't that interested in working with that. And so like you said, they would have to find ways to work around what the, what the data was saying. Uh, they aren't able to do that the way they could in the past. So it, um, would, it would seem that processes have to be in place to test right. the data. And how has that changed? The, the processes work because now we've, we've started to understand that business is a process. Uh, business using models like business process models, for example. That's a relatively new technology. It's probably been around 20 years, but it's relatively new in the way it's being used inside corporations. So they can say, okay, not only do I have an answer, but this answer exists in a business process model. And, and uh, if you want to attack whether or not the result is correct or incorrect, you need to go into the business process model and show us why it doesn't work in terms of the way the business works. Sometimes even building the business process model gets you a lot of uh, value. Just understanding it, going through it, and sometimes you'll show that to an executive and they'll say, I didn't know that's the way our business worked. So it's a, there's a revelations that occur. Once you, once you get agreement on the model, on the business process model, then you can go back and say, I want to gather data here, 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 and here, and then I'm going to be able to talk about you know, what are the changes in data, what's the, the streaming of the data look like, how does it change over time, uh, what kind of analysis can we run again, can we run clustering or regression or other methodologies against it. But the key is you have to know how it exists in place, in the place of a business model. So I can see that being an interesting discussion too, is right, getting separate, agreement on what right. that business process model right. should actually look like because you know, the, the, traditionally there's some schema that people have, right. a mental model, and that, that dictates mm -hmm. you know, the business process mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when we talk to practitioners, they say that, that 
The number one, number one challenge they have and tool set they use is data integration tool sets mm -hmm. for their big data initiatives. Right. The second one is their existing data warehouse. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. traditionally has dictated that business process model, but I'm inferring from your comments that it's changing. How is it changing? It, it, I wouldn't call it changing, but I think people are recognizing the fact that you have to understand the business process model as well. What you mentioned with regards to dealing with the data and understanding it, that is certainly a big part of it because that's driving what your model is, what your, what your, what your business process can do, but it's also good to step back from the model and say this is what it looks like. So, so from our perspective, that's what we did. We built hundreds, thousands of models that basically looked at different parts of the business, how they interacted, you know, what the steps that were taken, what resources were needed at each step, what data was needed at each step, what data, how could we do a better process if we had better data at this point? So you could ask a lot of questions that were basically driven by a business process model. You could also ask questions that are driven by data. So I, I see it coming at from two different directions towards the same, same result. How about the, how about the data mm. sources? I mean, P&G is renowned mm -hmm. for you right. know, listening to customers, focus groups, surveys, and, right. and, and the like. Samples. Structured, uh -huh. unstructured, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. We did unstructured work uh, 20, 30 years ago with, with approaches called content, content modeling, for mm -hmm. example, which was an early unstructured data uh, text-based analysis techniques. So we've been doing this for a very long time. So right, P&G does that. P&G now has a system called One Consumer Place, which gathers a lots of information from consumers about what they like best or don't like best about various products. Again, these things are getting very large, they're getting very big, they're also very volatile. Uh, as, as the world changes, as, as something new trends, you know, the way consumers think about a product may change very radically as well. So we certainly try to uh, innovatively look at all the capabilities like Twitter, like other methodologies, to say how do they change what our data looks like now and what will they change our data as it looks like in the future. So I like to ask mathematicians, mm -hmm. mathematicians yeah. these questions. So right. we've had some data, big data practitioners tell us, mm -hmm. particularly in the financial services industry, mm -hmm. sampling is dead. I think of John Abbey right. Meta who said right. sampling is dead. Um, and then at the same time we've had Nate Silver on, who takes a small sample right. of you know, electoral results or, or polls right. and nails the election every time. That's a sample. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, how do we well, make sense out of that? I don't think it's dead. To be honest, I mean, <laughs> I've been involved with a lot of sampling-based techniques within with a company, and Procter & Gamble does lots of that. We used to have rooms full of statisticians. Don't have as many of them as we usually as we used to have, but we have that today. We, and, and basically the idea is you, stamp, sampling has its place, uh, just as uh, big data kind of methodologies where you're looking for outliers that really don't fit a sample, but they show you unique insight into something you're attempting to achieve. So I, I don't think it's dead. Uh, I think it's been put in, in its place, perhaps. I think I've been perhaps pushed a little bit too far back, mm -hmm. but, but the methodologies, you can, you can use sampling, you can use other non-causal type techniques, for example, Bayesian techniques, et cetera, that, are very, that can be very valuable in their own place. Everybody talks about mm -hmm. the skills shortage in right, big data, right. and it just seems to me, when, you, when we, all, we always ask data scientists, what, right. are the, what are the skill sets that I need? They, they're, they're skill sets that exist. It's sure. just a, a mashup of those skill sets. Seems it, to me a huge opportunity for organizations to train up their existing staff. Absolutely, and we do staff. that. We, we try to, I mean, before, before I retired, we, 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 tr we got people young, tried to train them in our business, because it's a very key po point to know the business. It gets back to the business process model. You have to know enough about the business process model that you're talking out about to be able to deal with that model. But you also need the mathematical skills. But, but what I always think, I think about that as the mathematics can be taught or there are degree programs out there. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to, tell, to teach the business skills. Mm -hmm. So we tended to look for people that were willing to learn the business skills, but certainly knew the mathematics from, from the point and of view. As John was saying, the storytelling. Some questions from the yeah. crowd chat. We got an, first of all, we got an amazing crowd chat going on with the influence of Brian Good. Fonzo Good. Uh, and Carla is running an amazing <laughs> crowd chat. Carla Gentry, data nerds, or we're on data they're underscore nerd. Yeah. Um, the question from the crowd is right. very simple from Tim Crawford. Right. Are folks too constrained by business process model when thinking about data? Uh, they, they are, to be honest. Just to say, the same way that I say that business process model is important, uh, you have to understand that it's not rigid, and in fact, even worse, it's not correct. In other words, you can interview a lot of people and discover a business process model, and then you can discover afterwards that that is not the model that is really operational in that company. But what I look at it as, it's a great place to start. It makes you think about all the parameters that are involved, what's actually going on. Uh, it can be pushed back on. So absolutely, I, I agree. In, in a sense, I agree with it. But, but so frequently, it's not done in corporations, and it should be done. 
And what's, what do you see as, a, as something that will move to a better, is there like a checksum process that you can do to this? I mean, how do you avoid the, the pitfalls of falling into the, that, that hole of, of being stuck in, uh, being we define the process, the, the we're done, you know? Well, you need, you need, you need to use uh, you know, what we call knowledge, uh, um, knowledge gathering techniques. And there are a lot of techniques mm -hmm. where basically, if I had three people in view involved in the process, I need to talk to all three of them. Uh, and I, separately, and I need to figure out, are they telling me the same story or are they telling me a different mm -hmm. story? And you'll frequently, frequently, I say, almost always get a diff somewhat different story. Uh, so there are means by doing that. The other thing you need to do is, you, all business processes change over time. Mm -hmm. You need to go back and you need to, to revisit the business process to make sure you understand what's going on and whether or not it's, things are still working the way yeah. you, you expected them to. So again, I, I'm not saying that they give you a, a truth, a total truth, but I'm saying that there's a, they're a good place to start to, to work into your, and then work your data into that. Franz, we appreciate you mm -hmm. taking the time here. Sure. Um, if you had to go back and advise the Procter & Gamble guys, you come back right. and get transported right into the bridge room there and all the executives and had to describe, what does engagement mean today? Engagement is, means being, getting the data that you need to do your job. Whatever, whether you're an executive or you new, new hire, you need to be focused in the right data to do your job. And, if, and, that, and they frequently do not have that. It's, it's not the data that they need to do their job. So it's focus, it's, it's enough data, and it's enough analytical so, techniques to support that. So the that. word engagement is changing from systems of engagement to more broader definition, right? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's broad, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. we are here inside theCUBE as part of the VIP social program here that IBM is doing. This is theCUBE special presentation inside Inside Go broadcasting here in the social lounge. All the influence, IBM is doing a great job. Uh, really putting together a great set of influencers with a lot of sharing, organic. It's like an unconference within the <laughs> conference. We've got a crowd chat going on right now with the influencers. We're here broadcasting live here for two days as theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>